Remember the alien interview that went around some years ago and that recently resurfaced? I made at least one video on it talking about John Stewart, former gubernatorial candidate and pro wrestler John Stewart, about his investigation into this amazing, amazing video. Well, you're about to watch an amazing gangbusters interview with John Stewart. Very privileged to have him on, uh, but I just wanted to refresh your memory first about this very intriguing video. And uh, as you can see, the, the being is starting to go into distress. And uh, in a moment, the, the doctors will come and start to work on him. And then you can see his, his mouth going. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just feel so bad for this being, if indeed this is a real being. Uh, and I want you to carefully note the eye movements, uh, the, the muscles around his eyes, how they seem to move. And um, it, it's kind of hard to watch uh, because I, I, you know, this could indeed be a real being. And uh, if so, he's clearly suffering. Uh, he's in um, S2, uh, you know, similar to S4 on the Area 51 region. And he is being interviewed by these doctors. And he's not doing so well. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a tough video to watch, but very fascinating and may, may be some of our best evidence that there is indeed, uh, uh, there are indeed non-humans at Area 51, or at least there were. But if you look very closely, you can see little micro movements in its face. All right, time for the interview. Oh, and I apologize for the audio, uh, my audio in the interview. I think my, uh, the, the wrong thing was connected to Zoom or something. I don't know, but that's okay because I don't do a lot of talking. John has a lot to say and is super fascinating and his mic is working just fine. So here goes. Oh, and please hit like, subscribe, share on social media, and let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Oh, and if you wanted to support Cosmic Road in a bigger way, please consider becoming a channel member. See the first link in the description below. All right, you want to know more about the alien interview that was shown to Congress? Well, we have uh, as a special guest, a uh, former wrestler and gubernatorial candidate, John Stewart, who made it his mission to uncover the truth about that amazing interview. So very welcome, John. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And let me just uh, give a little disclosure here uh, to your viewers and listeners. I want everyone to know that I approached uh, Jack and emailed him to be on this show. He did not contact me. I went out and contacted him for the simple reason, and I can't give any more of a compliment, bigger compliment to anyone, for the simple reason that I saw him talk about this alien interview and my investigation and he just approached it with an open mind and talked about it like a gentleman. And you and Jack, you you just, you know, you didn't you didn't weigh in on yes or no. And and, and you were 99% accurate on everything you told everyone. And you didn't become a, an ad hominem attack, you know, uh, skeptic. And uh, that really, that really, I really appreciated that. And I'm like, I, I got to go on this guy's show, answer any questions, you know, maybe lay out more of the story. And uh, so here I am. And well, thank, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you very much for those kind words. Well, you know, yeah. my, my research has shown me that uh, the beings probably have interacted with uh, human beings uh, in the government. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if there were an actual alien interview. And this could very well be one. And yeah. you have done a lot of research on it. I, I know that uh, during yeah. the pandemic, you got really fascinated by this. Can, can you tell us a little bit how you got into this? Yeah, living... Uh, I famously tell this story i was a uh, follow the bouncing ball on this folks I was a full-time wholesale exporter and importer automobile dealer i was living in a condo in downtown chicago in this uh called the gold coast i was driving a, a, a black eight-year-old porsche uh i had a boat on lake michigan i was dating this sexy blonde who's now my wife of 23 years and, and running for 
poor woman, when running for state representative on the weekend. So I and and pro wrestling on Saturday nights, you know, all around the country. I had this crazy life. And I say that not to impress anybody, but to impress upon people that that this video grabbed me and never let go of me since 1997. And that's when I saw it. I'm thinking an alien alien interview. It's going to be a weird looking human being at the Pentagon on closed circuit with a clipboard for a job interview. I mean, this is how, you know, you know, my brain worked back then. I see this video and it's a it's a tan alien. It's not great. There's no CGI or special effects. It's one cut. No one's trying to do a professional job of hoaxing. The medics come in in short sleeve scrubs, not biohazard suits. There's a couple of military people in the foreshadow. Their shoulders get in the way. Um, I see the bean's mouth open and close instantaneously. And Victor tells us this was filmed in 91. And I'm like, this is either the worst hoax of a gray alien or this is the real deal. Like, you know, uh, because you're not, it just it seems so casual and so unprofessional that no idiot in Hollywood could produce this. And I know the, the CEO and the director of both documentaries, they're very intelligent men. There's a way he would have done a way better job hoaxing this if, if I can be so, so glib. And it was the testimony of Victor. I mean, I, you know, a psychologist tell me that I probably have run into 10,000 people in my crazy life. I've never heard anyone speak more intelligently, scientifically than Victor. And I, I, I was just putting two to two together. And then what's on the bottom of the screen, DNI for Department of Naval Intelligence and the number 27. That's the bombshell here, folks. Um, I, I just couldn't figure out why you would put an, an, an acronym on the bottom of a film that of, a, of an agency that doesn't exist. You couldn't find it in 97 when it came out. Jack, you can't find it in 2023. Why would you put that on the bottom of a film? I would have put CIA, Area 51, S4, uh, you, you know, uh, alien, uh, gave the alien a name or EB, even, you know, extra, you know, and gave it an, a file number, anything but a fake, you know, so you've got a gray alien that's tan. You've got a gray alien with round eyes instead of almond eyes. You've got this bizarre physiological monitor, which is where I started my investigation, that goes up and down. You've got uh, casual medics coming in or doctors coming in. You've got one take. Um, it, it's uh, totally not fuzzy, other than the room being darkened by the production company. This when this VHH te test tape was handed to Rocket Pictures in '96, it had a bluish hue to it it was it was fuzzy um you could see the thorax of the bean it was the production company that darkened it and much to my chagrin because i think they really made it out looking look at least uh from on the onset that it could be a hoax you know trying to keep the body dark below but then you see the medic or the doctor flash the, the flashlight on the thorax of the bean and you see the whole body so um it was um Jack, I'm you know I'm gonna skip real, real uh, quickly, you know, uh, w because this takes three hours to tell. It's 1999. I'm running for Congress. I bow out and endorse Mark Kirk, who the, became congressman and a senator, still my friend. He is John McCain, uh, who I've been told don't mention his name, but I really don't care anymore at this point. You know, the gloves are off. John McCain gets brought in, Jack, to uh, to to go on a bus tour with us around the district the last week of the campaign. And we take a picture together. I famously had this on the wall of our car dealership. And um, after the picture, I said, Senator, um, real quick question. You know, my dad was in the Navy. He was a, a squadron troubleshooter, lead mechanic for AT-22, the F-9 Phantoms, F-9 F F Cougars out at uh, Corpus Christi, so, you know, just to kind of get, you know, a little camaraderie with them. And I said, I got one more question. I was, I was, somebody was talking about it. Do you know what the Department of Naval Intelligence is? And Jack, this jovial senator had like full black eyes, it seemed like. And he snapped his head and looked at me and said, you don't need to know anything about that. And he stormed off onto the bus and never talked to me the rest of the weekend. And I've talked to reporters that said, you know, you hit the third rail. We've had this, you, 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 people, reporters have had this interaction with mafia hitmen, you know, politicians that were, you know, that were, you know, uh, corrupt. Uh, you know, murderers that are getting caught, so on and so forth, that you know something is not right. 
And when he gave me that aggressive look and it stormed off and didn't talk to me the rest of the week. And I'm like, wait a minute. And I do wrap up here, wrap ups, Jack. So forgive me, but I have a, I have a video um, of a gray alien that's tan that doesn't have almond eyes. It's got round eyes. I see a mouth opening and closing. It's one shot. There's the most bizarre physiological monitor next to the bean. Somehow in 1996, really before the internet, a 23 year old screenwriter hired Victor who's the most scientific sounding person I have ever heard of and goes on an unrehearsed program, Art Bell, coast to coast, and answers an hour and a half worth of questions. Um, unrehearsed, you know, how could a screenwriter plan that? Um, now three letters of an agency that doesn't exist, Department of Naval Intelligence, but it does, on the bottom of the screen has just pissed off a United States Senator. And it was in 1999, Jack, I said, what in the hell is going on here? I mean, I don't, I don't know what this video is, but something, you know, and I'm going to use bad grammar. Something ain't right. And, 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 you know, I, I, I'm emotionally intelligent. That's been one of my calling cards in my life. I'm a Pisces. Um, you know, I have a degree in, in, in clinical uh, counseling psychology. I wanted to be a clinical psychologist because I'm an empath. I, I can read people and, and I'm I'm emotionally inte intelligent and sensitive, and I'm like this, this ain't right, man. This, <laughs> why is this guy so pissed off? So, you know, I live life, uh, and we move forward. Uh, it's the start of COVID, and and a producer in Hollywood who was a friend of mine, and I've given him show ideas. That's one of my unsuccessful part-time jobs. It was, which was developing ideas for reality shows or, or documentaries and you put a little package together and I send it out. And if it goes on air, you get a commission. And, you know, so he said, John, you know, we're all stuck inside. Do you have any ideas for a cheap, fast documentary? And I went over some ideas and one was the alien interview. And he said, eh, you know, I don't know. It's, you know, it kind of looks fake and, you know, I, I, it's going to be too detailed to do. It's not a quickie. And it stuck in Jack. It stuck in my head all day about this. You know, it's, it's almost like I got triggered, like PTSD. And I mean that sincerely. I'm not being, I'm not being glib or anything, or hyperbolic. And I remember I came home about four hours, you know, early that day. You know, of course it's COVID. Everything shut down. Our dealership is barely open. You know, because of Illinois rules. And it's uh, and I remember the day. I remember we just blacked out our driveway. I remember the car I was. In. In my driveway, and I said, John, this is bothering you. It's not going to go away. I know you're, you know, I'm talking to myself. I'm like, I know your personality. You're an alpha male. You're going to, you're going to keep chewing on this. Figure something out. You're, you know, enough with investigative journalism and by being in politics, figure some one thing about this film out that you can either prove or disprove it. And I just want to tell people I'm a journalist. I'm an investigator. I am not a ufologist. I am not a guy that wants, you know, alien, the alien phenomenon to be true. I know it to be true, but I, that's not tantamount to my research. I simply wanted to know the truth of this video. Jack, if, if an hour from now, somebody calls me and says, my dad was a FX guy. He's got that uh, animatronic puppet in his garage. Get your ass to LA. I'll show you. And I proved the video, which is all I, I want to do. And I still want to do. So I said, look, the monitor, it's a, it's a physical thing in the, in the, in the, um, the video and it goes up and down. It does not go across and it stays put and it's, and it's a real thick whitish green. It was bizarre. And I heard that Jaime Musan and Sean David Morton back in 97 said, look, we took this to heart surgeons and heart thoracic uh, uh, surgeons, uh, uh, EMTs. They all said, this is showing some sort of cardiac arrest. You can't fake this. I had an FX guy and folks, I tell both sides of the story when I have it. So I hope you appreciate that. I had an FX guy said, oh, it's just a pane of glass. Listen to that. Just a pane of glass out with brackets. And somebody could have a laser on a servo and just bounce it up. As my, yeah, just bounce it up and down. And, and a doctor uh, that I told Jaime Musan, after I told Jaime this, he's like, oh, you mean the special effects person knew exactly how to coordinate a cardiac looking arrest? on a heart, on a physiological monitor to coincide with the alien's distress. <laughs> I mean, come on. A little bizarre. So, um, so I be, you know, here's my investigative journalist. I find three of the experts in the world that's, that are doing their PhD thesis on the history of physiological monitors. Do you, could you contact anybody more, you know, more expertise? 
I sent him the crop video without the alien. The one of this PhD candidate called, wrote me back and said they were from Sweden. He said, I have no idea what you're looking at. We don't, we, I'm showed it to my colleagues. No one knows what this is. We've never seen this in our entire two year, you know, research of physiological monitors and we can't help you. We don't know what this is and we don't know why the, the there's a, a, a scientific name for the blip and I always forget it. Why that stays put and, and doesn't go across the screen horizontally. And I'm like, wow. How, I hope people appreciate that. That's just not enough for me. I'm an investigative journalist. It's three sources, not one. So I continue in my car. I call Space Labs, not to be confused with SpaceX. These, uh, they did monitors for NASA back in the 60s. They still do physiological monitors. And I ask for their engineering department. I get an email. I send the, the, the video to, uh, to the email. They write me back. Um, we have no idea. We've never seen this before in our lives. We took this to everybody in, in, in our research and engineering department, physiological research department. Nobody knows what this is. Three PhDs, space labs that did monitors for NASA. Having a clue. Okay. But it could be a pane of glass with a laser. Okay. Now I get Hewlett Packard on the phone and I call their engineering department. I talk to a, an old guy. I asked for specifically for a seasoned veteran in your physiological research R&D department. Give me an old guy. It worked. I couldn't believe it. It was like a Seinfeld moment. I was just like stunned. And I sent him the video and he, I call him back and he's like, uh, son, I, I don't know what you're, what that is. Uh, what is this again? I said, this is a video supposedly from 1991 of in a government underground facility. And he's like, well, I, I don't know what we're looking at, but I've never seen that before in my life. I said, let me ask you something. Have you seen this in drawings, in concept, uh, around a, a table of engineers that there was some way a pane of glass and the blip would stay still? He said, no, I, I, there's, there's, a, there's a scientific reason why it has to scroll across the screen. That's how it's monitoring the electrical effect of the heart, you know, the injection, the refraction, the injection and the release of blood. And he said, there, that, that, that doesn't make sense. He goes, um, but before I hang up, I, I think we got a one-off. I'm like, oh my God, this what wait, what's a one-off? You know, got excited. He's like, well, in any, you know, any scientific or any kind of field, if you can't figure out something or solve a problem. And he said, like, you know, you wanted to find gold, you would make a metal detector. And they did eventually. He said, this might be a one-off where they specially built this machine for a special purpose. I said, well, let me let the cat out of the bag. This allegedly was was allegedly built, if that's what you're telling me, uh, to monitor the bizarre physiological uh, heart and lung, because it's one organ of an extraterrestrial being, thinking he's going to hang up, he's going to laugh, you know, go at my, don't ever call us again. He's like, I said, would you do that if you had an off-planet being with a, with, a, with a weird heart lung organ instead of a regular human heart? And here's this you know, guy in his 60s from Hewlett Packard, you know, been doing this forever, said, yeah, that's exactly what we would do because a human physiological monitor would be useless for, you know, let's say an alien, you know? Yeah. Makes sense. Like, okay, uh, let's see. It's uh, we're about two hours into this, John, and you can't find anybody to debunk that, that monitor. Now, uh, five days later, and I'm going to go quickly after this. I send the video to Bill Mums. He was hired by National Geographic to do the frame by frame of the Patterson Bigfoot film. He writes me back. He said, look, I've been doing this for 45 years. Every foam animatronic doll during the drying process, the arms have to come down. It gets a crease under the armpit. Every single animatronic foam doll has creases under the armpit. And I'm like, and? He's like, your alien does not have creases under its armpit. And for the life of me, I don't know how they did that. I'm like, holy shit. I'm sorry if I could swear. I'm like, holy shit. And he goes, and there's one thing. I got the monitor. I'm like, well, what do you mean you got the monitor? He goes, well, it's not a pane of glass. It's an actual thin box, but there is metal bracketing around it. This is not a pane of glass. I'm like, well, that, that destroys the FX guy who said it was a just a pane of glass. That's the only way you could fake that and bounce the laser off a of circle. He goes, oh, no, 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 no. It's not a pane of glass. It's a box. It's a And it's a metal bracket around this box. And he goes, John, here's another thing. 
there's a bullet, a bullet cartridge protrude, looking protrusion in this metal bracket on the front of this physiological monitor. He's like, if we were hoaxing this, why would we want to bend the metal around a bullet casing or something that looked like the bullet case? I mean, why take the time to do that? And so again, here I have all this information. I've got a physiological monitor that's not known to man. I mean, I can make that statement. The experts say, not never seen it before in our life. And the production company that did this documentary was in a strip mall in Southern California. So we have one of the most advanced animatronic dolls ever invented, a physiological monitor that is defied and, and puzzled five experts around the world from a strip mall video production company. I'm just asking, does that even does that even jive to anyone out there that's listening? Whether you believe the video or, or the alien program or aliens at all, does that little narrative even make sense? I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me either. Now, why is the strip mall production company involved? Okay, here's the story. This is great because we have the visitor's log from Fox TV. This government, 1996, a government, retired government employee approaches Fox uns, uh, unscripted television department. I've got a three-minute VHS tape of an actual extraterrestrial in an underground facility. Now, they've been burned by the alien autopsy, but they bring him in. We, we've got him on the, on, on the call list, on the, the, the appointment list. They can't guarantee his anonymity. And Victor is tell, tells us this in, in the, um, in the art, art, art Bell Coast to Coast interview. And they basically kind of give him the bum's rush. He walks kitty corner over to a newsstand at Topanga, Topan, of, of Fox Studios to Topanga Boulevard, a newsstand. He gets Variety Magazine. Now listen to this. This is the, this is the company that produced this documentary in this high-tech monitor and beam. He sees a company selling the Tim Conway, the, the, the dwarf golfer comedy video. And he says, give it a shot. He calls him up and says the same pitch. And they said, come on in. He takes a cab because he doesn't drive. Something very important in our investigation. And he brings it to Rocket Pictures in Southern California. They're a second tier video production company. So they're game. You know, they're not, you know, they're not Fox. They're not Paramount. And, you know, they're not Warner Brothers or whatnot. So and they watch him and they and they get Sean David Morton in and um, after he leaves and says, you know, here's what it is. Here's this video. And um, Sean says, I am familiar. I've heard of us four before. And um, the director, Jeff Broadstreet's like he's the smartest guy in the world. Also the biggest pain in the ass in the world. Jeff Broadstreet, the director, said he this guy was literally to this day the biggest pain in the ass he's ever dealt with in our, in his life. And they agreed on a, on a figure. They agreed to, 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 for, for his anonymity, to protect his anonymity, and they produced the video. And here, here again with, oh my God, that's my washing machine. And um, they, um, here's another thing to know. So second tier production company, they put it on the UPN network, Strange Universe. We find out Strange Universe was so broke, it couldn't pay its employees for the first four episodes, okay? So let me get this, let me just wrap up. We've got a, the most bizarre and high-tech animatronic being ever created, according to special effects people. The mouth opens and closes, the eyes go up and down. We've got a physiological monitor that has, that has baffled physiological monitoring experts and engineers. And there was money enough for this production and to pay Victor and to make the doll in the monitor and pay rocket pictures themselves from a production company, Reicher, who did strange universe, who was so lacking funds, couldn't pay their employees for the first four episodes. Again, forget me, forget me, forget the video. Does that sound right? Does that if, sound? If, if that, if that, even, you know, if that you know what I'm saying? was a prop or something, that would be hideously expensive. Right. Now we now again, Jack, I hope you behind my back credit me. Let me tell you the back. Let me tell you what an FX person said. Yes. Yes. If you went to blah, blah, this and blah, blah, that company, they would have raked you over the coals to make that pop, make that animatronic doll. But we had two FX people said, hey, John, have you ever called a contractor on the side, uh, you know, just a carpenter to come and work on your house? 
it's way less expensive than if you called a big company and they brought over a crew and the boss has to get paid. I'm like, that's true. And we've had special effects people tell us, oh, we could have, could have done that for 10, 15, 20,000 back in 1996. Okay. I mean, and then you're paying Victor, you're paying for the production, you're renting the studio to do the B-roll, you're paying all the actors, all the, you know, craft catering, the casting call, Rocket Pictures has to make a profit, and Reicher has to make a profit. And everyone basically has no money, and they're all second-tier video production producers. It just doesn't jive. You know, it just, it just you know, I, I, I want to be an open mind that somebody could make that doll for ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, but... I have to believe, Jack, like you, that it's probably upwards, would have been upwards of forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars. They showed the thorax of the bean, you know. I mean, and, and also uh, there's little micro movements you can see around the eye if you look really closely. And I, it's yeah, the, hard for me to believe that they would have gone to the trouble of doing that. And if they oh, did, yeah, I'm man. sure that would have added on to the price considerably. Folks, folks, okay, great. So we've got an animatronic guy on the side that's doing a side gig. Okay, fine. I, I, I honestly got, I'm not being snarky. That's fine. But no problem. Would all of these production companies that were short on money, would they also pay for microscopic movements in the eye? Folks, this being, when we did the three minute analysis has four different eye movements. One that's round, one that's round on top, flat on the bottom, one that kind of goes in a point, and then one where the, the where it goes, one eye goes small and one eye remains the same. And he has five different faces. One where it's like a smiling, like a skeleton, the mouth open, the mouth closed. Um, it's got the mouth, the bottom lip is turned down. It's, people call it rusting bitch, but like a 57 year old woman where the bottom lip goes down. I'm not being mean, I'm just trying to describe. So the, the face has five movements. Why would you spend that money, okay, to do these micro movements? So a retired car dealer pro wrestler from Chicago 30 years later could have spotted? I mean, you wouldn't. You, you, you just wouldn't. It just doesn't make sense. You would do this as cheap as possible, you know, with the budget, which was nothing. And, and we were told this by Rocket Pictures. You know, we were, you know, it was a tight, tight, tight budget. To get this thing to get the to get this uh, to the to this uh, documentary to market, so we didn't have the money there, and with no money or little money, we're in, we're creating the most uh, bizarre physiological monitor and the most uh, you know uh, high tech animatronic doll in 1996. I call bullshit. Sorry. Also, if you were going to create a video with an alien interview. I, you know, my mind is open on this, but I do find it very unlikely that you would choose to have that being go into distress uh, and that that would be the subject of the video. I, I, I that seems like a weird narrative to put out, um, you know, uh, if you're creating a story uh, to present to people that, that, that just, you know, it doesn't ring true to me. It doesn't ring true. They, right. They could have got away with a 30 second clip with no uh, with no um, enhancement, theatrical enhancement to the to the film, which when they darkened it, and it looks looks great. The VHS copy that Victor brought in is, but if you were right, I would be Jack Wright. You and I would have just showed the thirty second fuzzy clip. It's blue haze with the beans of uh, thorax showing, and just show thirty seconds, and we still would have been wow. Oh, you know, this is. Yeah, you didn't need yeah. you didn't need it to go into distress and 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 have that mouth open instantaneously, folks. I tell everyone, forget everything. Take the last thirty seconds of that film, and zoom it with your fingers to full screen. Get that face in, in your entire computer monitor or in your iPhone or your Android, and you watch the last thirty to forty seconds of that film. And you tell me if that's an animatronic doll from nineteen ninety six when we still had the bad. You know, uh, uh, bad uh, Pirates of the Caribbean animatronics. Yes, yes, it was the same year that um, A Man in Black came out. But that little doll was very small. It was moved uh, within a photographer, you know, a photographic um, a setting. It just wasn't placed in a room, and the camera turned on, and and it and it for three minutes. It's you know, it's making all these moves. I mean, it was a coordinated Men in Black, and to make that com 
comparison is specious. It's ridiculous. Okay. Um, so it, did, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. No, just, no, go ahead. No, you're not interrupting. Did the production company make any money off of this? Did they make, a, I mean, if it cost tens of thousands of dollars, well, would they have made a profit on this? Yeah. Rocket Pictures told me that they made a, made a, a decent profit on it. Um, and they made a decent profit on it because they didn't build a, an animatronic doll and <laughs> and get four, four, five, four or five actors in a room and put them in military costumes and scrubs. And, yeah, they made money because they didn't have to pay to make that VHS tape. Do you know I, how I much mean, they made? I don't. Well, I, I got round about I got round about figures, but, uh, the, the you know, it was it was in the um, the high te the high tens. Does that make sense? It wasn't, you know, it wasn't uh, over a hundred thousand dollars. It was in the high tens. And, and Reicher Entertainment made money from screens from um, from the UPN network, of course, because they 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 I'm sure they signed a a production deal for you know you know ten, twelve, thirteen episodes. So, um, and this was put on as a special documentary. And they might Reicher might have went back to the UPN network and said, look, we've got this explosive one hour documentary. Could we, you know, this happens all the time. Could we extract a little bit more money, you know, to get this on that, you know, th that could have happened. But when we find out, found out that Reicher didn't pay its employees for the first four episodes, everyone was right, broke. Right. You know, everyone had, you know, the, the alligator arms. <laughs> you dig in your pockets and, and, and we're creating this, the most high tech, um, animatronic. There was a couple of scenes, Jack, where the we have the the head and body making like five different movements. Um, again, animatronically, it moves forward, tilts his head, uh, tilts his head, his chin up, in the same time tilting to the to the right, and and looking at a at the the military person in in the uh, in the viewing gallery. I, I mean, this is done animatronically. It's you know, and we have one more movement. This to me, as far as like an animatronic person and we were told it would take five five animatronic people to operate that doll the um the aid to the beans left our right on the camera moves slightly to the left and you see if you slow it down the alien moving with that person in the foreshadow how could you even put that in the show and how could you know that that you know um, if you're doing five people are going to know to move the beans head slightly to the right to follow this aid in the viewing gallery behind the glass. I mean, come on. I mean, also, stop. you know, when a movie is uh, using uh, an animatronic, uh, you know, puppet or, or, or what have you, uh, they use a lot of cuts uh, to facilitate the special effects. Of course. And, uh, you know, how could you not? I mean, that's the only way to do it. Uh, there's right. no cuts in this. No cuts. And, and we've talked to military uh, military cameraman, Jack, who said on something like that, where you're just there to document, you know, you're not there to show like um, technical matters of, let's say, uh, them taking apart a nuclear bomb or something like that. We've had, we've had multiple cameramen from the military said, yeah, you set it up on a pie trod, you press, you press. You know, you press start and uh, you start filming. It, it, you know, this isn't a this isn't a uh, Hollywood production. It, you, it, you're you're trying to document an event. Uh, uh, and and I we were told, we've been told by multiple people that this was going on for for 50 years at this point. Not with this being, of course. And this was kind of like you know, in in one of in in, in, a, in a person pantomime this. For me and I thought it was hysterical we were at a coffee shop and he's like you know John you know they bring the bean in and it's like everybody's like okay Hal you ready to you ready to film okay everybody ready and he takes a sip of coffee all right turn it on let's <laughs> it's like you know I hate to be um I hate to be insulting but it, it was not that big of an event for the government at that point you know we're just they were just trying to ascertain some information from the bean from a previous um, thought projection uh, in, interrogation, and Jack, this is this was called by the way because I'll tell you this very quick story of how I broke the information of the government's program. This is called uh, off the books the uh, alien interrogation retention and interrogation program, and this program uh, sits under Majestic. That's the overall umbrella program for everything alien from 1947. Um, uh, uh, Zodiac, 
uh, Zodiac program also is referring to this, but the the program or project to study all things extraterrestrial, biological material and and um, physical craft material was called Project Aquarius. And yes, NASA has a Project Aquarius. We've also found out that the government likes to use multiplicity so that when somebody researches Project Aquarius, they said, oh, that, you know, that that chubby guy on the on Jack's program the other day doesn't know what he's talking about. That's a NASA program. Yeah, it's also a government program. And these craft were were um, uh, were targeted, uh, acquired. Um, they were uh, uh, they were uh, uh, brought down in many times. Uh, the craft was recovered by Project Star and Project Pounce. Those are the two uh, Air Force uh, uh, special units that were trained to recover. We, Linda Moulton Howe, provided the manual on how to recover extraterrestrial craft and beans. I'm not, that's a true story. And so, um, but Jack, I, you know, so here I am, I have some now, I have some information, but I don't have knowledge. I don't have the names of programs or anything. So I, I said, you know, I'm like, I know through ufology and being, you know, a person interested in this, that when people write a book, they go on the radio, they go on TV, that sometimes that triggers somebody in the know to come forward to give them um, a film, documents, um, photos, maybe approach them in person. You know, this has happened to ufologists trying to break a case. I'm like, but I don't want to write a book. You know, I, I don't have any information. So I went on the Jeff Rince program. And just to try and metastasize this 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 uh, investigation, I, I again, folks, I, you know, I, I'm a car a car dealer. I'm not a you know, I'm not a scientist, and I'm not in the military. So I went on Jeff Rents, and about ten days after going on the Jeff Rents program, this was after my emails were swiped off my iPhone on four different email platforms on my iPhone, and 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 that's a whole nother story. Well, I mean, that in itself is suspicious. Well, Jeff Rents, producer, said, oh, that happens all the time to our guests. I'm like, excuse me? He's like, that happens all the time. Bart Sabell, the guy that did the moon, the, the, we didn't, we never went to the moon. What, regardless of what you think of his movies, he's like, oh, no, 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 no. They're, they're, don't, don't, have, don't worry. They're, they want you. To, this is how it starts. And, and, and uh, Chad Kalick, Mr. No-Face, uh, one of the straightest shooters in Hollywood. Uh, he did the documentary where he filmed a, a, a gray alien at a, at a shutdown facility in Australia. He said, John, I've been doing paranormal for 20 years. I've never had any weirdness in my life ever. The week that I started investigating extraterrestrials, my life electronically went absolutely haywire. And, you know, that just was like, I'm like, Jesus. And, and you know, then Jeff Francis producer said, oh, no, this happens to our guests all the time. Their emails go go kablooey. We, we can't get them on the air. The podcast breaks down. This, this happens all the time. And Bart Sabal's like, this is the way, this is them knocking on the door going, hi, hi, we see you. We're here. Yeah, we're here. No, don't worry yet, but we're, we're watching. So go ahead, carry on your investigation i mean how many people have to tell me that this is the case i've had other military people say look they listen to every single paranormal extraterrestrial podcast that's out there there are men and women that's their sole job is to listen to pick up anything that does that somebody got too far in their investigation um and and you know then follow up on it so 10 days after that i start getting i get an email from from a, a man and, you know, so I enjoyed your uh, your uh, your interview on Jeff French. You got some things right. You got some things wrong. I am in the know. I'm never going to tell you who I am. And I'll never forget this line. He said, if I can give your your investigation a nudge, I will. And um, I didn't hear from him for a month. Next month goes by. So that would uh, this was right after Labor Day. So like July and then August, he emails me one time. And so on and so forth. And I'm asking questions. And he's wadding me. And he's, you know, and, 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 and. Um, you know, I want him like I do. Is it was it VHS? Was it 16 millimeter? Was it is is it real? Where did this bean come from? You know, uh, you know, can you what what can you tell me? And um, on my birthday, coincidentally, so about 10 months later, on my birthday, I'm a public figure, but it would take a little bit to find my birthday. But on my birthday, I get from the horse's mouth email, and I stop off at a rest stop in Indiana. And my hand is shaking, like well, what is this? And he and I want to be specific here. This man forwarded me a defense intelligence agency internal investigation 
a briefing about this film. Yes. And um, you could tell now, now folks, I did not get, I did not see a document right from the DA. You could tell that the person that sent it to this man, you know, transcribed it himself on an email, almost like in conversational, you know, you know, uh, typing and then send it to this man. And then this was sent to me, you know, under strict, you know, orders, you know, you are never to share this with anybody. If you do, you are not to use my name, you know, which he never gave me. Um, and you are not, and you are not change the font, the type, and you are totally, you know, totally to never send this on the, this email chain. But okay, it's I'm funny. On, I'm on yeah. the edge of my seat. What, what did it say? Okay. I'm going to tell you. So, but it's funny. In the, um, in the email to this man from the DIA insider, it said on the bottom, uh, um, the guy's name. And please don't share this information. And uh, please do not, uh, please brief. I'm going to do, I, I want to be specific because the internet people deserve this. The guy's first name who emailed me, please refrain from using my name in connection with this material and information. Like Jack, I would send you a, you know, a friendly email and, you know, hey, Jack, leave me out of this. And I'm like, oh, this is, that's too weird. That's too real. So what, what did the document say? It was called uh, uh, the un an unauthorized viewing. Now, if I was hoping one person on the internet has said, oh, it's fake. How do you know it's fake? You've never seen it. If I was hoaxing this, I would have said, you know, theft from Area 51 or S4. It said unauthorized viewing. Unauthorized viewing. Not that it was stolen from S2, because that's where it was filmed, not S4, but unauthorized viewing. So, Jack, it gave me the date of the filming, how the time of day it was filmed. What happened to the bean that they re-picked up the questioning who was behind the viewing glass in a viewing gallery watching this interview? The names of those four military men, that the names of the two doctors in the room with the bean. Are you listening to me, folks? The name of the two doctors on either side of the bean. That and and it tells this. So here was the and I'm going to re, just you know paraphrase. This a film was filmed on April 22nd at 3:15. In the afternoon, the bean did become in distress. Once they stabilized the bean, the interview continued. And that pissed me off because it's like, the, you know, the government, instead of just letting the bean off the hook for them till, till the next month, is like, uh, uh, hell, is he stabilized? All right, let's go. Let's pick it up again. That, that's it's harsh. That's harsh. A, a break. It's dying. That pissed me off a little bit. Whatever. Uh, you know, though so it said um, after the bean, the bean was stabilized, the interview was picked up. Um, they were trying to find information about an object under the Indian Ocean. April 22nd, 1991, S2 Alpha facility. Then it said, um, then it gave the names of the men behind the glass watching this thought projection. I don't, um, I don't describe that good enough in some podcasts, so I hope I'm doing that right. That right. So like a good investigator. Um, oh, and this was called an other gray. It was designated in this report as a haploid, which is a being, a biological being that has one sexual chromosome. Human beings are diploids. We have two sexual chromosomes. I later find out that in the evolutionary process, pretty proud of a car dealer to find this out. In the evolutionary process, it is advantageous to be a, 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 a haploid. I don't know why. But we hear about evolution and, 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 you know, what these beings and stuff and that there are from our future off times, they're from our lineage. So I found that passage that being a, that being a haploid is advantageous in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, you know, in, in evolution. And um, it was called the Another Gray. It was from the planet Tau Ceti, C-E-T-I. That is in the Zeta Reticular star system. It's a planet of that. Uh, it's not, uh, Zeta Reticuli is not, uh, binary. It's actually got three stars, if, if I'm correct. And this is one of the planets. Tau, T-A-U-C-E-T-I. Excuse me. This is not the main gray. This is a biological android, so to speak, of the gray sent down to kind of be the worker bee. And I, I'm going to use that a lot, the worker bee, the, the beehive, the beehive mentality. Because a lot of military people hammered their home with me. So the first name on the list, let me, let me spin through these. Um, uh, U.S. Army Intelligence gives his name. 
He's a son of a famous World War II um, person, not Patton, not MacArthur, and not Eisenhower, but he's a son of a famous World War II person. His dad was also, I have found out, I've seen the document involved in figuring out and researching the Nazi UFO program. So I find that weird how his son is in the program. But his son's retired at the time of the filming. He works for TRW. I'm like, well, this is this a hoax. You know, I'm ready to give up because this is way too complicated. <laughs> so I call Sean David Morton. I said, yeah, no, the one guy from, worked at TRW at the time. It's a hoax. He goes, are you, are you like, like stupid? I'm like, what? He goes, TRW? It's like BlackRock and Lockheed and Skunk Works and Boeing and, and, and EG. And they do more black projects than almost anyone. If anything, the fact that he was working for TRW proved, you know, bears out that this, this list of men might be legit. I'm like, holy shit. I call his house and I finally got through about a month ago. But I called his house like two years ago. She's like, I, I know you've been calling me, but you're asking, you're finally the wrong so his last name. And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. She's like, no, that man lives on the East Coast. So got that lead. That just happened, you know, a month ago. The next person was a captain in naval intelligence. So I Wikipedia him. Jack, this is so bizarre to see these names and then to see them in Wikipedia and Google searches. And Linda Howell, who has this list, along with Dr. Sala, two Hollywood producers, three law firms, Four government employees, Congressman Tim Burchett. Uh, Jack, I want your listeners and viewers to know I didn't hide this from anyone. You know, I'm not one of those guys. Uh, for $9.99, you'll see the names. No, you're going to see it in a documentary eventually. But this list is with has been with about 15 different people that I trust. Just to let everyone know that I did not hide anything from anyone. So I find out he was in, uh, he, he retired a, a vice admiral living in Virginia. I'm like, what? This is another hoax. My investigator, a partner, uh, a researcher, Chris Jackson, lives in North Carolina. He's like, dummy, this is from 1991. Do you think in 91 he was just a captain with naval intelligence? Do you think maybe 30 years later, then he retired a vice admiral? And I'm like, oh, my God, that's, that's true. Jack, I emailed this guy. He emails me back. I email him again. He wants me to call him by his nickname. I don't wear the uniform anymore. You know, like, we can be informal. This is incredible. Admiral, what is with the fried chicken in Virginia at these gas stations? He laughs. Oh, you can, if you ever come here, I'll take you. To, it's, it's fantastic. Folks, I'm, there's like famously good fried chicken at Virginia gas stations. I said, yeah, do you, uh, what do you do in your retirement? Do you play golf? Ha, 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 you know, blah, blah, blah. The fourth email. So I know you emailed me for some for a reason about this documentary. What is the documentary about? <laughs> Well, I got to send him the, the ball of wax. I'm like, look, I, I respect the military. I was one of the progenitors that kept the North Chicago VA open in 1999. That's a true story. And I brag about that because I'm so proud of that. And the military to me is, is should sit on top of the pyramid of the importance of in, in American, American life. And I sent him the report with his name on it. And Jim, a little Seinfeld here once in a while, but it's true. And I'm about to press the send button. I'm like, don't do it. Don't do it. You know, is this guy going to call the Pentagon? Are they going to put a hit on me? You know, and I sent it to him. He ghosts me. Now, this is a guy that was going to take me out for fried chicken and golf in Virginia. He ghosts me. And I, Jack, I don't know about you and I don't know about your viewers and listeners, but if you ghost somebody after those interactions in 2022, which when this happened, you're speaking a million words. And I've had military people say, look, we won't lie to you if we're honorable. We just won't talk to you anymore. And that's what he did. You, know, you can interpret that as much as you want. He didn't laugh at me. He didn't call me crazy. He didn't say, I'm going to kill you. Where did you get this list? He said nothing. Dr. Michael Sala of Exopolitics emails him. He just, he just politely, um, you know, tells Dr. Sala, I'm not interested in talking about anything or about my naval career. Why? <laughs> you want to tell us, you know, that you went to Marrakesh and, Germany, and you know, and you almost died in a plane crash. So I don't know what happens in the military. Well, so apparently I, I John can't... McCain felt something similar. Yeah, he just uh, ghosted you as well, or you told you you're not not to ever to talk about it again. What did he say? Now, folks, did I bring that up or did Jack bring that up? Thank you, because you're going to hear in this entire entirety 
no one has laughed at me. No one's hung up. No one's hung up on me, but everyone, you know, doesn't want to talk. And I find, and so thank you for bringing that up. Now I get to the next guy. This is the only name that I'll tell. And Jack, if you want to do this in post-production, that's great. Rear Admiral uh, uh, Schaefer, nicknamed uh, uh, Ted. Ted Schaefer, Rear Admiral, Navy. Find out that he's the intelligence liaison for the Joint Chiefs of Staff reporting to Colin Powell. I'm like, okay. Find out he's dead. His wife lives in Palm Coast, Palm Coast, Florida. Please don't contact her. And um, so that's the first, the only name on the list that I'm I'm telling you because I think that trail, and it's important to know that this man was in the Oval Office with Colin Powell briefing George Bush. You need to know this for the ending of the blockbuster, you know, the bombshell. Now I get to the next man. It's the doctor, and he's got a nickname, and I find out that. Uh, the only thing I found out on, on an obituary that he was died when he was like 82, 83 years old in California. This is a doctor, you know, helping out with the alien interrogation retention program. Remember Bob Lazar, Danny Burrish, whatever you believe with them. I didn't even know what I believe with those two. Remember how so many people tell you how they wipe. It's called sheep dipping. They wipe your history clean. This is an 83-year-old doctor practicing medicine for 50 years. There is nothing on him in the on the internet. Now somebody said, "Well, that was the internet. That was before his time. That's fine." I have found men born in 1920 who, you know, uh, John Stewart in 1963 hit a hole in one at the Mission Hills Country Club, and you're in a newspaper. I can find anybody in the newspaper. A marriage, uh, um, a marriage announcement. Um, you know, uh, getting an award. You're telling me that a doctor has disappeared. It is nowhere on the internet. Like a good investigative reporter, I keep, I find his wife, his second wife, who he widowed. I get her phone number. I call her up. She answers. Yes. She got a short name. I'm going to call her Kim. Kim, and this is like telling somebody, you know, your husband was a cross-dresser. Think about how embarrassing it is to call an 80-something-year-old woman to tell her that her husband was involved with extraterrestrials. And I'm not being, I'm not joking around. It was really embarrassing. And it was, it was... It was uh, uh, the the black guy that does uh, Family Feud now. Um, oh my God, I always forget his name. Steve Harvey. Steve Harvey's got the great the greatest line that was tantamount in me being successful in this investigation. If you're not comfortable with being uncomfortable, you're not going to succeed. And the old John Stewart never would have called. Never would have went through these uncomfortable moments. You know. And I said, Kim, my name is John Stewart. You know, um, I, I, I've i got some information on your husband. This is really uncomfortable for me. But is there any possibility that your husband spent time in Nevada, south of Area 51 or at Area 51 as a doctor involved with? And I said, Kim, I, I, I'm, I, I feel so weird. There's silence on the other end with extraterrestrials. Silence on the other end. No hang up, no laughing. You're crazy. Nothing. Silence. He goes, John, that's that's interesting. The light bulb's going off in my head. <laughs> George Costanza makes a good point, like a you know, like a successful phone call. I'm like, uh, well, why is that? She's like, I'm gonna tell you a little story. It's the widow of the doctor to the alien's right. Sorry for getting hyper. He goes, We have a big group of friends. These men are in from Korea, World War II, Vietnam. Whenever we go out socially for the past 20 years, they all tell funny stories of boot camp or a funny drill sergeant or some humorous or interesting story that's non-combat related. And she said, it's funny for 20 years, my husband never spoke and never said anything about his time in the United States Army Medical Corps. I looked down at the paper. That's what his, that's the division he was in. I don't even know what that is. So this woman who's 80 something in California who didn't know I was calling has just backed up what's on this piece of paper that he was in the United States Army Medical Corps. To this day, I'm not even sure what it is. She told me that it's where the doctors go in the Army to learn, you know, to finish up their residency and fellowship or, you know, and, and become practicing doctors in in the armed services. I never knew that. How if I never know that, how could I write that on? You know, it's just it's 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 crazy. So she said, and my, my, our friends would ask me behind uh, his nickname back that, you know, why doesn't he talk about 
his time as a doctor in the army. What, what did he witness? What happened? She's like, I don't know. And she said, John, your phone call. This is the doctor's widowed wife on the aliens, right? She said, in your phone call, just completely makes complete sense to me of why my husband never spoke about his time in the Army Medical Corps. I send her the video. I call her back in five minutes. She's like, that's my husband on the on that beans right. That's wow. his nose and those are his eyes. I'm like, wow. Tim, are you sure? She's like, John, that's my husband. Okay. It's like, that's oh. huge. That's yeah, amazing. Huge. 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 Not not somebody that called me and, hey, heard you got a list. Let me tell you something. I'm When you go out and search somebody and that person's in their 80s and they're giving you that information, it's even more bizarre. The next doctor. No, no. She gives me the name of her daughter who lives in the south suburb of Chicago. She's like, I'm family. I'm going to be invited to Thanksgiving. Then here's her number. If you need anything else, call me back. Thank you so much for contacting me. I'm like, what is going on here? You know, now I know I'm down the rabbit hole. The next person on the list was the doctor to the beans, to the beans left or right. <laughs> but it says on the DIA report, I've never told anybody, this scientist with a question mark. And um, and so I'm like, wow, that's interesting. They, even the DIA kind of really didn't know what this doctor really did or didn't, or maybe in this report, maybe it never really identified him, you know, just because, you know, it just because it was just put together and, you know, no specificity. I Google him. He's practicing medicine in Connecticut. <laughs> the website of his office with his lab coat on and his, you know, his name and his specialty and stuff. Here's the bizarreness. So this is from 1991. Remember, folks, the bean has a coughing and breathing problem at the end of this video, a respiratory problem. What do I find out in 91 what he did? He was with the VA in 91. What did he do in 91 with the VA? The VA, which is like, a you know, the bullpen for the government. You know, they can pick out doctors and put them anywhere. He was a pulmonologist in 1991, which dealt with breathing and the lungs. That made me fall off my chair. I mean, I had to stabilize myself. Like, how could, how could somebody get these bizarre random names and, you know, remember to, to get them to hoax to send me a, pulmonologist because the bean had a breathing problem. I mean, come on. And um, called his office like three or four times. Somebody, in my opinion, uh, either tipped him off, he got wind, or like somebody else told me, John, if you killed somebody 40 years ago and all of a sudden you live this simple life as a factory worker, a reporter from ABC News wants to talk to you about something in your past, you're going to be Put two and two together that this bizarre thing that you did or you you were encountered has probably come has probably surfaced, right? I mean, I think anybody, and I probably shouldn't have said, you know, said that I was a documentarian. I gave this uh, entire list also to Ralph Blumenthal and Leslie Keene, who write for the New York Times. Leslie wanted to go make an appointment and do us. She said when she's in the examination room. I mean, this is how much that Leslie. I Ralph, love it. Let's get Leslie Kane on board. Yeah. So, um, and Ralph's like, no, 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 let's, let's, let's hold off on that. So then it gave it the name, the, uh, it, it, it gave the vocation of the two telepaths. And then it said, um, and then, cause this is the only time, this is the only point Jack, where I thought that this could have been a hoax about how Victor said, allegedly it was taken out of S4. Because you're weighed in the nude when you go there. You're weighed in the nude when you leave. You're not sneaking a thumb drive up your butt crack. You're not sneaking out a CD-ROM. You're not. And I'm like, this is the only crux. This is where I don't, why I don't believe this video. It tells how it, it left. Just like Ocean's Eleven. The money was let out of the casino. It simply says, once the interview was terminated, a United States Air Force, I'm verbatim, a United States Air Force policeman escorted the United States Air Force cameraman Back to Groom Lake, not Area 51, back to the Groom Lake Photo Lab, instead of saying Area 51, Groom Lake Photo Lab. Three days later, two copies were made, and a digital overlay graphic was also inserted on the film. That's where you have to physically put the DNI slash 27. And I'm like, this is it. It was let out of us, too. Not stuck out. I'm like, oh, thank God. Thank God. It's 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 backing up which what I always which I always felt, which was this is a hoax, because nothing is leaving that facility. It was let out. 
It also says two copies were made. One copy was put into a GSA burn bag. Jack, I don't even know what the GSA was back then. It's the Government Services Administration. They do public auctions and and laundry and and, and grounds groundskeeping and and uh, you know and and maintenance and whatnot for the for the government. And it was put in a burn bag, and that's how it left Area 51 to later be connected by a man named Joseph Yeager. And it said we believe that Joseph Yeager was Victor. You know, he's not. So even this report was, you know, was even like sketchy, like still not kind of sure who Victor was. So he, Victor, did one hell of a job of separating himself. You know, he gave the wrong date for the film, which I think was done on purpose. Um, how he how he smuggled it out, which was done on purpose. And in my opinion, it was the cameraman who was the hero that removed this from the facility. And we've talked to other military people, folks, if you think the security is like so stringent at Area 51 and 91, it really wasn't. Wackenhut and EG and G did the outside security, but inside it was Air Force MPs. And you would sometimes, this is what I was told, know these men and, and women for five, six, seven years. Some days they would check your purse. Some days they wouldn't. Some days that you'd have to empty your pockets. Some days you weren't. Some days they checked your gym bag. Some days they didn't. It was lax. And, and one military person who worked at Area 51, including an 85-year-old man that I interviewed six weeks, six, I'm sorry, six months ago. I couldn't get him off the phone, by the way. Um, he, uh, he said, no, 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 no. It, it was it was pretty lax. It, believe me, yes, you you could have you could have got stuff in and got stuff out. Even Victor said and bemoans this. How could an actor think of this to complain about how people brought in personal effects to S four um, and put them on their desk? You know, obviously um, uh, agreed to by the project manager or security, but that bothered Victor because he was always told, "Don't bring any personal effects. Don't take anything out. Don't bring anything in." So on and so forth. Which I thought was a weird anecdotal story. So now I've got all these names and, and whatnot, and, and 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 here's one of the bombshells. So I'm 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 looking at the email of the man that emailed me once a month for nine or ten months. So I'm sorry, I just never thought to nine months when he first started to back backtrace the email. I have a program to do this, and the email that he that he used goes to a. And I'm going to be very careful here, Jack, an institution in a major metropolitan city. Excuse me. And so I find whose email it is, and it's a woman. I find out what she does at this institution. I call her. When I called her, you have to understand, I probably made 800 phone calls in this investigation and never, nobody very rarely answers the phone. The receptionist says, and who may I say is calling? On my, on my right hand to God. And I'm like, Art Vandelay? Hold on, Mr. Vandelay. <laughs> so there are some humorous moments and people don't like that I would use some humor, but I am being truthful. So I'm like, how could this lady not catch? I just use a Seinfeld reference. So the woman answered and I, you know, I got discombobulated and I, what, what she does for the institution, I made a fake question. I just wanted to make sure she was a real person. But I asked her, you know, this, this email address, she's like, oh, that's my secondary email address that I very rarely know. She's like, did you get emailed by that? I said, uh, yeah. She's like, oh, I don't know how that happened. And, you know, so on and so forth. And I really covered my tracks and we hung up. Now I go and um, get the first name. Remember that was on the, the email. And I go and find out this woman's name and her maiden name. And I do two searches with the first name and the maiden name, first name with the, with the, um, with the other name. And here's what I extrapolated. My dad was on the board of directors of a credit union. They had an opens meeting law in Illinois. You had to meet one day a month on the same day every month. I go back. This guy emailed me the Tuesday of every month for 10 months. And I extrapolated that this guy must have been on the board of directors of this institution, right? Do you know what I find out? This woman is his daughter. So when he went to the board meeting once a month, he went to her office, you know, in most board re meetings, my wife is a special event director of a boutique hotel uh, in the North shore here in Chicago. And I know this for a fact, you know, uh, huge corporations have 7 a.m. board meetings and sometimes they have them at seven o'clock at night, you know, and when he would go to the board meeting, he would go to his daughter's office, use her computer 
and email me. So that was like my, you know, Barnaby Jones Colombo moment. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm a, the greatest detective in the, in the history of the world. So now, now I Google his name and her maiden name. This guy's got, you know, it's got like 50 pages on Google. Very prominent man in his 70s. You know, he's at charity events and whatnot. I'm not going to say any more because he is my deep throat like with Watergate. And until he dies, I will never, ever, ever reveal his 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 name. But it was shocking that this was not some, you know, 50-year-old guy living in a mobile home in Alabama. He was, you know, this man is a prominent individual. Um, and he did tell me that he had a contact with the DIA. And then I also heard that there were six men, Linda Moulton Howe backs this up, current and past employees of the DIA who want disclosure. So... You know, did did I get chosen for this little bit of disclosure? I think so. I think it's possible. Do I think that this man, Doug, and 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 uh, you know, did all of the detective work, or did he think that you know, did he possibly? This is my speculation. Just call a contact at the DIA that he knew and trusted, and said, "Look, you know, I got this guy. He's interested in this crazy video. Can you tell me something about it?" And that's when he got the report. And um, after my birthday, he emailed me one, la you know, one last time with, a, you know, good luck. If I can ever try to do anything, if anything comes up, I will, you know, email you back. Um, I haven't heard from him since. And um, so it, all of the, you know, the names and the photos of everyone in, in their bios and this guy having a very high place in society, so to speak, it just all put a face and a name to it and made it really, really bizarre, really, really bizarre. And um, amongst all the other like idiosyncrasies and stories and coincidences that that have happened, um, uh, let me just go right to the bombshell because you know it, it's like remember my cousin Vinny? He just doesn't stop when he gets five clues right. He keeps going and going and going, and they find out what the real you know uh, burglars and murders did and where the gun is in the car, and so you know he just hammers every single nail, and I made sure because I love that movie that I did the same. So I'm laying in bed, my wife, my poor wife, if anybody ever meets my wife, pat her on the back because she could have quashed this investigation. Your husband staying up till four in the morning, watching one documentary after another, just to garner any kind of information. So it's like four in the morning. I'm watching the Linda Moton Hall documentary about the Ronald Reagan briefing. He got allegedly on extraterrestrials and they're showing the documents. And above every document is 27. And I think people could start to know where I'm going. So I wake up my wife. I'm like, Joanne. She's like, what? Like, These documents in 1980 for Reagan had a 27 on him. There's 27 on the film. She's like, well, well, ask somebody about it. So I call one of my military contacts. And I said, what is, what is 27, you know, security-wise? Oh, that's Yankee White. I'm like, okay, what's Yankee White? He's like, John, that is that number Yankee White in 27 is put on documents, film, any kind of material literature to signify to anyone that unless you have the Yankee White designation, stop watching, you know, close the manual, close the photos. You're not authorized. I said, what is Yankee White? He said, well, that's the designation for anybody that briefs the president of the United States. And I'm thinking, he goes, does that make sense to you? I'm like, yeah. There was an admiral in this film who's dead, who was the, lay, the intelligence lays on a Colin Powell. And I know for a fact he was in the Oval Office, you know, in the Oval Office with Colin Powell saying, and uh, my, my, uh, my assistant will now hand me the packet to show you briefing George H. Bush in the 90s. So, I mean, so what you're telling me is a screenwriter in 1996 knew to put 27 on this film. And, and put Department of Naval Intelligence. Let me tell you the bombshell Department of Naval Intelligence. Can't can't Google it. You go to the off. It, it takes you to the office of Naval Intelligence. But I have a friend who's a naval aviator. Yes, he's a, 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 a teacher. He's got six kids. Naval aviator. You know the the guy, the kind of guy that lies. You know, being facetious. And I said, Michael, what what's the DNI? Uh, and he said, that's the Department of Naval Intelligence. I said, okay, is it real? He goes, of course it's real. I said, why can't I Google it? Why can't I find it anywhere? He said, you're not going to find it. Why? 
He said, because it's an, listen, folks, it's an agency tucked in the ONI. It's like the CIA spokes of the Office of Naval Intelligence. You're never going to find it. They have their, there's no etching on a door. What part of the Department of Naval Intelligence? It's nowhere, but everywhere in the Navy. I'm like, oh my God, that's fascinating. I'm like, how do you know this? Because they tried to recruit me before I went to Naval Aviator School in Pensacola. Like, this can't be happening. Fascinating. I, this this Fascinating. Just can't be, can't absolutely not be happening. I'm like, well, you know, thank you. Let's, you know, keep in touch. You know, we have a, a, a an interest in another, in another subject matter and stuff. And it's just a matter of fact, like, you know, uh, and then texting me back, right. And texting me back, uh, you know, right away on that. And, um, you know, I, I, I just, I came basically to the conclusion that, um, you know, uh, and then I was told that this the, the facility S2 Alpha is the main facility, the main entrance where the AHC is. And I asked the military person, I'm like, what is the, that's the alien housing complex. I'm like, okay, sure it is. And he's like, no, the S2 Alpha is, and here's the, shows me a satellite photo of it. And he said, beneath S2, which is the administrative like level above ground, is the S3 complex and the S4 complex. And S4, that's what Burrish and Bob Lazar talk about. But this guy says what a lot of other people have said, doesn't believe or know that there's hangers with painted doors, that that part of the Lazar story is, I can't verify that at, what, at all. And Victor's story that this happened in S4, I've had multiple people tell me the alien interview program was done under S2, not S4. And um, one, one, one more thing. Um, uh, you know, so I take this investigation to Congressman Burchett. I sent this to maybe 30 reporters all over America, six months before the David Grush testimony comes out and the David Grush testimony comes out. I'm like, oh my God, the New York times are going to call me. It's a, this is it. My investigation has been proven. And, and that really has fallen flat in Congress. And I am going back and I'm now going to take this packet of photos and, and investigation uh, in the uh, DIA report to a couple to uh, four or five female congresswomen. Maybe they can do something more that Congressman Burchett, you know, can't do. Uh, I'm a little pissed off at that because I at least wanted it on the official, official record that I went there, that I submitted this investigation. This film, Jack, allegedly was shown to three congressmen. And the report is that one congressman was shaking. Another one could not put the cup of water to his mouth to drink it. This is how affected that these men were when they saw this, you know, particular film. So I am continuing to, to, to press forward and to, to, to put this into the, the congressional record, so to speak, and get it on record that, um, you know, what I, what I have discovered. And, and further after that is I just, you know, I feel uncomfortable about myself to be one of these people that helps the government simply come out of the closet with the alien phenomenon. You know, it's time. It's it's leaking everywhere. And at some point, um, this has got to come out. And uh, I'm not saying every single bit of information. I don't think everyone in the world should know how to time travel. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, but I, that's how I feel. I don't think everyone in the world should be, you know, flying, you know, uh, you know, uh, energy list cars all over the, the planet and the skies and and I understand some of the secrecy, but it's been 80 years. It's it's over. It's time. It's you know we have to let we have to let this uh, matriculate in, into the public and um, and and that's the investigation. And open that any is questions amazing, or, John. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. You did an exhaustive investigation in this, and you got yeah. so many pieces of evidence. So yeah. I guess we are either to believe a broke production company designed and utilized the most sophisticated prop of all time with right. no edits, or or we look at all the evidence that you have compiled, and you have quite a bit of it, uh, to suggest this was in fact a real interview with a real being. Uh, right. Do you have any more information on that being? You said they were trying to interview it, because it's not a him or a her, uh, for information about an object under the Indian Ocean. Do you have any That's idea correct. what that could be, or do you have any other no, never, information never, about uh, what, what other interviews it may have had? Yeah, you know, so Victor tells us that it died shortly after um, that interview, and um, we confirmed that. And the object under the Indian Ocean, this was right after the Gulf War. Um, you know, we 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 still don't know. I've not I've not gotten any research information on that event. 
Um, I still don't know where I can tell people, look in the camera and say, I know for a fact where this bean came from. People are talking about the Kalahari crash. I don't, I don't even know if that's, if that's true or not. I, I still don't know where this bean did, did come to the S2 facility in, in some time of 1989. Victor was correct about that. Excuse me. And, um, uh, uh, another, um, oh, and I got, I just, I just lost my train of thoughts about, uh, an, another anecdotal story, but yeah. So, and we also, you know, and, the, and it was from, uh, the Sao T Tau Seti planet in the, in the Zeta reticular star system. And, um, you know, there's conflicting reports and I'm honest about that. I can't verify it. And this, they, they, we, I've had people tell me we have nine craft, we have 12 craft. I, we have six, um, uh, uh, deceased beings. We have two dis uh, living beings. Um, most of the military people in this program have determined that there are no living beings anymore in reten being retained in any government facility. However, their their bodies are still, you know, retained in in some sort of cryogenic storage. And then about about six uh, weeks ago, just to prove the the S two complex and to, to kind of refutiate S four. Uh, Master Sergeant Michael Munoz comes forward and he starts chatting everybody up on a YouTube video that people are like, oh, how does he know all this? Me, me, he, me. And he's like, no, John Stewart's correct. His information's correct. There is the, the facility S2 Alpha is south of area 551, uh, uh, northwest of Papoose Lake. It's the administrative office. He tells how security would be conducted if a high ranking official would come to the Papoose Lake complex. <laughs> he's just Melting like like I paid this guy to <laughs> the computer, and we still have him. He's still going to testify in our documentary, and it's just one more level of you know. And, and Jack, I tell people, forget about the film, forget about it. Listen to all of these bizarre stories of the follow up of the investigation. That to me is tantamount to proving that this is that this program and this film is real not the film itself but these follow up stories we're still 5 years later no one's laughed at me no one's hung up on me and no one's told me i was crazy you know yeah. and and um and uh it just it's, you know this, these are our cosmic brothers and sisters so we're going to have to eventually come to to embrace them i don't know whether they come in peace or whether they come in harm or what society i i mean i look at the uh, amazon in the 1800s with all the british you know, explorers that went there. There were explorers that were cartographers, biologists, environmentalists, thrill seekers, vacationers. Some people treated the locals in the Amazon fine. Some didn't. Some interactions went good. Some went bad. Why? Why is that any different with, you know, extraterrestrials? You know, I've I've gotten my ego in check that I know I'm not on the food top of the food chain anymore. And maybe I'm like a deer or a brook trout. And the, the aliens are like the Department of Natural Resources. I have to come to grips with that. And I have. And I just don't find anything wrong with that. You know, we tag, we extract blood and semen and ovum from animals. Why is it any different from a higher level of species doing that to us? So, Well, we absolutely need it. disclosure. I mean, humans need to know yes. what reality we're living in. And uh, if there are beings on this planet sharing this right. planet with us, or at least this reality with right. us, and they are visiting us, that's something we need to know, and we deserve to know, and to be treated yes. like children that don't deserve to know the truth, it's just wrong. Um, yeah. But okay, it's, so it's I have marking a, our It's marking our loyalty, it's it's belittling our citizenship, it's 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 time that this, you know, that this has to come come to come to a head and, and come. And, and also, they seem like they've done some pretty shady stuff in the names of secrecy. Uh, and you know, there may be some wrongs that need need to be redressed on the, all this, and some things well, that glad, need to be set right. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, your checks in the mail, but I'm glad that you brought that up because one of the things that I'm so upset about with Congressman Burchett was when David Grush came forward, completely backing up my entire investigation and narrative of a of an alien retention interrogation program and kick craft and biologics being retained by the U S government. When he said that people have been murdered to keep this secret, I, I Jack, I, I, my right hand to God, I thought for sure within three or four days, somebody from Congress or the FBI would, would have contacted me to say, you know, um, you know, we've got your investigation, you know, there might be a chance you might be in harm's way or, you know, no, but just, you know, Hey, it just you know toss me to the side that that's what that's what really bothers me and thank you for bringing that up because that is that is the reason that i'm pressing forward by 
taking this investigation back to different Congress people uh, in late October. Well, now that David Grush has gotten the idea of alien biologics into the public consciousness, yeah. uh, maybe yeah. you'll get more traction. I, I certainly hope so. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. You could see this growing. People contacting me, um, uh, you know, a podcast and 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 um, and and other uh, media outlets, you know, wanting to explore more because this is no longer a retired automobile dealer pro wrestler bringing this forward. No matter how deep my investigation is, this is a special agent with a Q cosmic top secret clearance coming forward, and along with congressmen. And along with other military people telling you, pilots in, including, that there's something in the sky and we have no idea what it is. And I always thought the government would never admit to not knowing what really this is all about. But they have. And and that's the biggest step for disclosure. So I, I'm encouraged that this, you know, will keep pressing and we will. Um, well, I'll, I think this is going to bring the country together, to be honest with you, because we're certainly not together now. We're you still bashing each other over the head for a $10 toaster on Black Friday at Target. So I think this will bring the country together. I really do. Well, you know, that's what Reagan said. You know, if there was a, a cosmic threat, it would bring people together. Well, what about yeah. just a cosmic brotherhood? Maybe that would bring people right. together. Exactly. Oh, okay. So I've got a couple more yep. questions. Sure. Uh, do, do we know who Victor is? Yes, we do. I, I mean, I'm not, I can't say his name because I'm okay. under a contract with the sure. documentary, but he was a, sure. was a government. Let me just tell you some stuff about him that uh, won't violate my agreement. Um, government uh, retired biologist took, waited five years to bring this forward until he was retired. Very smart. The director of the video emphatically says that he, uh, that he did not drive. He did not drive. Um, and, and, and he, and he um, geez, I almost said his first name. Uh, did not drive. Um, a pendactic personality. We had two people from the Reed School of Lie Detection that police officers and FBI people take that course. They both said that Victor displayed stress of a whistleblower and that he had a pendactic personality, pedactic personality, which many scientists have. It's a very precise, rigid personality. Um, we had another person, experts and whistleblowers, said that Victor displayed um, you know, dark humor, which is very common amongst whistleblowers. It's a it's a it's a byproduct of being very stressed. Uh, you make dark humor comments and whatnot. And um, uh, 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 what else can I t uh, tell about uh, uh, that wouldn't uh, in encumber? And, um, you know, that uh, he backs up the story of being basically thrown out of Fox, coming to Rocket. And then also, too, he comes back in 08. This is what a lot of people don't know. There was a second documentary in 08. Victor comes back. He's pissed off that people have not done any good research, have not done any FOIAs. They didn't find out who Victor was, and he's livid. And he tells that he's dying. And we, in fact, know that he died in 2010. And um, which I find weird, this whistleblower comes back from this alleged hoax, and he's egging people on to prove it real or not. And the director says, well, a lot of people think it's real. And Victor says, "I, but that's they're taking it at face value. I don't want anyone to take it at face value. Prove that it's real. And he talks about these FX people. He's like, if this is a puppet and this is so easy to do, then do it. Make your puppet. Prove me wrong. And I just thought that somebody, if, before I knew who Victor was, somebody who's hoaxing and comes forward and says, come on. <laughs> prove me wrong I, that to me does not sound like a guy that's doing a fake you know per, that brought forward a fake video and, and a fake story and victor even says you know he hates donald rumsfeld he has to find out where donald rumsfeld was on april 23rd i found out where he was on april 23rd 2008 and, and i get a real weird email from his foundation mr rumsfeld was having easter dinner with his family and that's all he did in taos new mexico Donald Rumsfeld is from my area, the Ivy covered buildings and homes. I'm not my specific neighborhood, but the area, you know, it's the home alone neighborhood that he was born in and he ran for Congress. And then he lived in Georgetown. Now he, in, oh, in, in the 2000s, he moves to Taos, New Mexico. Now I find that, that members who, I don't know if this is real, that members that the, the public group that runs Dulce Base meets in Taos, New Mexico once a month. Did he move there to, to, you know, to run these meetings? I don't know, but I just found that there was a very interesting 
you know, correlation. I can't prove it, but again, a little bit of weirdness. But I did everything Victor asked to do. I've, I've done FOIA requests. Little Jack, a real quick story with the DIA. I did a FOIA request. I follow up on it. He, uh, the guy named Andrew at the DIA, listen to me, folks. Mr. Stewart, I see your name on our computer, no file next to it. I'm like, okay, so what? He goes, well, that can't happen. You can't get on this FOIA computer without a file request next to your name. It's impossible. I'm like, well, what are you telling me? He said, well, somebody had to come in and remove it. Andrew, DIA FOIA department, somebody had to come on this computer and remove your file. An hour later, wow, lo and behold, I get an email, FOIA request. I've got it, I've got it on YouTube. But it says, um, due to the nature of your question, of your FOIA request, we will have to then now talk to other agencies, have counter uh, interconference meetings with other agencies to discuss the nature and the proposal of how we will disseminate this information to you if there is any information to. And um, so, yeah, so I'm, apparently in the history of the DIA, I'm the only son of a bitch that had a file removed. And I'm just asking why? I, retired car dealer. Why, why am I getting, you know, my file removed? And let me finish with one last thing. I got in contact with a, a, a employee with the National Air and Space Institute Center uh, in Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. His code name was Holden. And the, 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 he told me, he's like, well, you know, the government could have filmed that. But, uh, you know, I have had people in the Pentagon tell me it's blacklisted. If it's maybe a hoax. Why is it blacklisted in the Pentagon? And he said, there's a new designation for extraterrestrials. I can't believe this is not floating around the internet more, but I'm going to tell it again. The new designation from this agent, from the NASIC and Wright Pat, is saber, like a sword, synthetic astrobiological extraterrestrial races. So there's something you have for Thanksgiving dinner to impress your friends. But that is the new designation of these extraterrestrials by the powers that be that run this program. Uh, majestic and Aquarius. And I thought that was jaw dropping. And then he disses me and he sends me back a text after I begged him for three months. What is going on? Are you alive? Are you okay? And he sends me this real terse test. You could tell that somebody made him write this to me because he was a very nice young man. You are never to contact me again. I have to cease and desist all contact with you. You are on a special watch list with the Pentagon, which other military people went ballistic when they heard that because that is so illegal. And I still don't believe that even though I did a FOIA request on it. Um, and you are never to contact me again. Why? Why can't a car dealer from Chicago contact you? What do you, you know, th th these, th again, forget about the aliens. Forget about the video. I want your viewers who are skeptical to tell me why a retired used car dealer, a bust out professional wrestler can't be contacted by somebody from the National Air and Space Center. Why? Pretty sketchy, pretty sketchy. Who's removing my file at, D at DIA? Why? Yeah. I'm a yeah. car dealer. Come okay, on. Okay. Okay. I've got two more questions right. for you. Okay. All right. Go ahead. All right. So do we know any, do we know anything about how the being was recovered? It was was it a UFO shoot down? Was it a crash? Do we have any information about other beings that were recovered at the same time from the same ship? Or? I, I will I will not speculate because I cannot verify that at all. And I don't want to take it off in another direction. I cannot verify that. Again, I've had people titillate me. The Kalahari crash, one being went to Wright Pat, one went to Area 51 because it was in 1989. I know it came to the facility in 89. I cannot verify whatsoever how this being was acquired. Okay, okay. And the information about Zeta Reticuli, did that yes. come from the being? No, that came from the DIA report. Okay, okay. All right, all right, all right. And these are called the other grays. That was specific in the DIA report. This was, this is, again, I want to reiterate, this was, this is not a typical gray that's, that's bluish gray, the almond eyes. This is almost like the worker bee for the grays. That's why the DIA report said other, this is referred to as the other grays. That is so fascinating. I want yeah. to know all yeah. about it. And yeah. I'm sure our, uh, some of our viewers are on board and really, yeah. really uh, are probably going to start investigating this. And uh, Please do. Help me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jack, I always give credit to so many people that have helped me in military, Hollywood, um, uh, UFO experts, you know, all the echelon of people in the UFO community like Dr. Greer, Linda Bolton Howell, Dr. Salas, Sean Morton. 
um, uh, Reverend Michael Carter. I mean, all these people that just gave me tidbits. They were my muses. You know, they, 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 they constantly making me go on. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't give up. You know, so I, I want to give credit and anybody that could help with this investigation. Come on board. Okay, no one, one more question. You, did you say that the alien retention program was no longer in effect? No, it's no longer in effect at Papoose Lake. Okay. The entire, uh, the very important, that, God, man, you're a good interviewer. Very important. Um, the middle of the 90s, the, uh, the uh, Alien Housing Containment Center and the entire Project Aquarius has been moved to Michael's Airfield at the Dugway Proving Grounds. And there, Ooh, there, they juicy. built a super, super huge high-tech underground facility. Sandia Labs has a lab on top of that, which is a little bizarre. Why does a public, you know, why does a private uh, company have a uh, lab on top of uh, an, an air, uh, Army base or an Air Force base? But yes, this has all been moved to, uh, to, uh, to Utah you know, the new Area 51 at the Dugway Proving Grounds. That's a fact. There's a lot going on in Utah. It is a hot area. Yes. yes. Uh, yep. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you so much for joining me, John. That was a fascinating interview. I, I was thank really you. grateful for your time and your dedication on this topic. You have compiled so much evidence and you have gone out of your way to interview people and talk to people. And I hope more information is, is forthcoming and maybe some too. of these people will, will come out into the light. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the Jack, the, the, you know, I, I never really understood Hollywood could take this long, the glacial speed of a documentary coming out being sold. Um, even if it comes to the point where I just have to sit down in a theatrical setting and just explain the story, have the people's names on the screen. The only thing we're wrestling with right now is we don't want cameras and film crew and ufologists to now start going to this doctor's office or to this Rear Admiral's condominium in Virginia. So we're not saying it's not going to happen. It's just it's something that we are very trying to delicately approach and, and figure out how we can best do this and, and, and bring forward this information. So, all right. Well, if people it's want to come contact on. you, well, well, first of all, are there any projects that you're working on that people should know about? Yeah, I'm, I've uh, my my book uh, about the second Roswell crash. As I was investigating this video for five years, I came across five different or six different accounts that there was a second Roswell crash. That book will be out either October 28th or November 28th, and it's called Magdalena, um, the second Roswell crash. I think people are really going to enjoy it. I, I don't make any speculation. I just take the six accounts. I put them into a colorful prose story of all six different witnesses and accounts of a second Roswell crash and what they, these people have all said, who, you know, and try and get, get, filter the information. I make one little small, you know, statement and declaration of who, what story I think is most applicable, but I think people will really enjoy it. It's very, I'm not patting myself on the back, but I, I, I really took my time to, to, to write it. So it's, it's interesting because, you know, Roswell, New Mexico, it's a lot of sun and dirt and sand. <laughs> Sometimes it, it, it's not as, you know, exciting as glamorous as, as it's made out to be. So I tried to at least engage, engage the reader. So I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. I hope maybe I can come back on your show and, and talk about that. The book is called Magdalena, the second Roswell crash. It'll be strictly on Amazon comes out either October 28th or November 28th. And so I'll like give you my email because I'm not on, I'm not on, um, not on social media. I don't charge for anything, which is I've been trying, even though I'm down about $20,000 of my own money for this investigation. I think it's very, you know, it's, it's important to tell people this guy's not selling anything. <laughs> he's, he's in, he's, he's deep in, in debt because of this project and this investigation. And I'm proud of that because I don't want, I, I want to be as, as, um, as unsmirched by, by money as, as, as we can, as we can until we have the entire, ball of wax all together so i just i'll give people my email if they want to drop me a line and if Go they've got anything to add it'd be great it's uh, my full name j-o-n without the h my middle name alan a-l-a-n and my last name stewart spelled like john stewart the comedian at aol.com and drop me a line and I, i've gotten credit i answer every single email i make sure if you take the time to reach out to me i'm going to reach out back to you that's awesome, John. Thank you so much. I can't wait for your book. And by all means, uh, come back on the show and uh, talk to me about it when the book comes out. Look forward to it. Thank you, Jack. Thank you to all your viewers. It's an honor to be on your show. Thank you.
All right, thank you so much. Wasn't that an amazing jaw-dropping interview with John Stewart? Thank you again, John, for that amazing information and all the dedication you have poured into this topic. Uh, let me know what you think about all this, guys, in the comments below. And if you've enjoyed this video, please give me a big thumbs up. I sure would appreciate it. Smash the subscribe button and the bell to be notified of future videos. You don't want to miss a thing. Join me on social media. There's Facebook and Twitter links below. I would love to see you guys there. If you wanted to support Cosmic Road in a bigger way, please consider becoming a channel member. See the first link in the description below. Channel members are rock stars, and I really appreciate you guys' support. Thank you so much. Meanwhile, there are plenty of other videos to check out on the channel, and I'll see you next time. This is Jack with Cosmic Road, signing out.